Genesis not meant as literal. The uh, question mark, of course, is meant to say that I, I don't start out with that position. And uh, we're going to be looking at a, uh, a paper that was referred to in another paper. Last week we talked about radiocarbon and dinosaur fossils and uh, that article is on the internet. Uh, you can find it there. And I'll just read the abstract real quickly again. The recent discovery of radiocarbon in dinosaur bones at first seems incompatible with an age of millions of years due to the short half-life of radiocarbon. Note a couple of things. One of them is he is not disputing that radiocarbon is actually found in dinosaur bones. And that is a major step forward in my opinion. Um, and then he goes on to say, but it can't, that can't really be true because evidence uh, from isotopes other than radiocarbon show that dinosaur fossils are indeed millions of years old. And fossil bone incorporates new radiocarbon by means of recrystallization and in some cases bacterial activity and uranium decay. Because of this bone mineral, fossil or otherwise, notice that uh, bone collagen is not covered in this. Uh, is a material that cannot yield an accurate radiocarbon date except under extraordinary circumstances. Which means he hasn't read the literature very well because there is actual uh, dating of fossil uh, 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 collagen, which kind of blows the theory he's pr pr proposing. Mesozoic bone consistently yields a fossilly young radiocarbon date. It must be fossilly because Otherwise, it would be truly young, and that would kind of shoot that uh, 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 shoot his uh, uh, worldview, really, of a few thousand to a few tens of thousands of years, despite the fact that it is millions of years old. Science educators need to be aware of the details of these phenomena. This is getting so uh, well known at this point that teachers are having to deal with it, and so he's writing this paper to help them deal with the problem. Uh, to be able to advise students whose acceptance of biological evolution has been challenged by young earth creationist arguments that are based on radiocarbon and dinosaur fossils. So that's what the article is about and it gives you an idea of its purpose. Where we're going to be particularly interested is in the further comments that he has after he has made his um, uh, presentation and his summary and conclusions. Teachers who encounter students who have been misled by young earth creationist arguments that are based on radiocarbon and dinosaur bones are encouraged to direct such students to the information presented here. So. This paper is specifically written in order to counter young earth creationist arguments. However, young earth creationist publications have generated a plethora of other anti-evolution arguments. It's interesting that he puts it that way. Uh, not procreation arguments, but uh, anti-evolution arguments. And it would be useful to be able to counter those as well. It is therefore worthwhile to note that there are four recent books that together refute nearly all of the young earth creationist arguments that have been published so far. Isaac, Prothero, Cain et al., and Center. And Center, of course, is the person who's writing this himself. And we're going to see that reference coming up in the next uh, paragraph. Additionally, for students who profess loyalty to the Bible, it would be useful to know that several passages in the Old and New Testament instruct against taking Genesis literally and therefore that the Bible itself does not support the young earth creationist view. Such passages are reviewed in Center 2019. That's the book that uh, he just referenced. And um, some are partially reviewed in Center 2016. 
It would be worthwhile for teachers to know of such resources so as to direct students to them when appropriate. Now, the next part of that paragraph is even more interesting. It is legal, at least in the United States, to address religious concerns that students bring up in science classes as long as the teacher does not endorse one religious view over another. So you cannot endorse one religious view over another. If you do, then you're on shaky uh, ground. Such, uh, part, such studies on conceptual change suggest that addressing such concerns may be effective in helping students feel comfortable accepting evolution in an old earth if their objections to such concepts are based on religious concerns. Uh, again, this is another study by the author of that book, or that uh, article that we reviewed yesterday, uh, last Sabbath. Uh, such help could be a useful supplement to science-based refutations of young earth creationist arguments such as those presented here regarding radiocarbon and dinosaur bones. So he's actually recommending the uh, Center uh, 2019 and Center 2016 as supplements to the article that we reviewed last week. Now, Center 2019 is Fire Breathing Dinosaurs, The Hilarious History of Creationist Pseudoscience at Its Silliest. Um, does seem a little uh, uh, mocking, shall we say? Um, and like I say, it, uh, uh, it does not actually uh, it is not actually a landmark book as far as I can tell. Not only does our library not have it, which is, I suppose, not surprising, but none of the libraries around this area have it either. So, um, uh, so at least other people are not considering it a major step forward. But um, Center 2016, is Christianity's earliest recorded heresy and its relevance to Christian acceptance of scientific findings is actually online. And uh, uh, it's in a journal called Thinking About Religion, which I haven't run into before, but uh, uh, it's volume 12 and apparently it's a totally online journal. Uh, and that's why uh, I just have 12 because I, there are no page numbers to it. And, uh, and again, it's available online. So let's take a look at that article and see what it has to say. The abstract, and this is the complete abstract. Um, New Testament passages on the peritomes, or circumcision, a heretical faction in the early church reveal a controversy in early Christianity between literalist and allegorist interpretations of the Pentateuch. These New Testament passages advocate allegorical interpretation and constitute inter instructions not to take the Pentateuch literally. A major obstacle to public acceptance of biological evolution is the interpretation of Genesis as a literal account of events. By advocating a non-literal approach to the Pentateuch, the New Testament removes a major obstacle to acceptance of biological evolution and other findings of science that contradict the literal wording of the Pentateuch. That's the thesis that he's going to argue for, and we'll see how well he argues it. Introduction, Genesis, uh, the anti-evolution movement within Christianity is based on acceptance of the biblical account of creation in the book of Genesis as a literal historical document. This in turn is based on the principle of adherence to biblical wording, a principle that anti-evolution authors accept. Because evolutionary theory contradicts the view of Genesis as a literal historical account, 
the principle of adherence to biblical wording appears to advocate rejection of evolutionary theory. A rather straightforward statement, and I would have to agree with most of what's being said there. But does it? If some other part of the Bible instructs readers to reject a literal interpretation of Genesis, then the principle of adherence to biblical wording demands that Genesis is not to be taken literally, in which case believers who follow this principle are free to adopt evolutionary theory. As I shall show be below, numerous passages in the New Testament instruct the reader not to take <coughs> Genesis literally, thus giving Christians biblical permission to accept evolutionary theory. Okay. To grasp the message in these New Testament passages, it is important to first understand that when the New Testament was written, Genesis was not considered a standalone book, but was instead considered volume one in a single five volume work called the Pentateuch. That the uh, Torah, the law, Torah is simply law in Hebrew, um, the book of Moses or simply Moses. The five volumes of the Pentateuch became the first five books of the Christian Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, after the Christian canon was settled. Together, the narratives in these five volumes relate the stories of creation, the flood, the lives of the patriarchs, the Israelites' journey from slavery in Egypt to the Promised Land, and God's handing down of legal and ritual regulations to Moses. In the first few centuries AD, this grand saga was treated as a single comp composition whose author was thought to be Moses. That is worded very carefully. The author was thought to be Moses, if you will read note two. I don't read all the notes. Some of them are just references and some of them are uh, not particularly helpful, but uh, two is interesting. Modern scholars have determined that the narratives in the Pentateuch were woven together from previous sources by at least three ancient authors. See John J. McDermott uh, reading the Pentateuch, a historical introduction. Um, but in the first few centuries AD, Jewish and Christian scholars had not yet figured this out. So, um, He's going to accept that the New Testament writers believe that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. He is rather explicitly rejecting the idea that they were right about that. Post-New Testament Christian authors, within today's Christian anti-evolution movement, the narratives in the Pentateuch are thought to be an accurate record of history. Numerous ancient Christian authors agreed with this, uh, that assessment, including the 5th century authors Theodore of Sir, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Augustine of Hippo, Severian of Gabala, and John Chrysostom, the 4th century authors Diodorus of Tarsus, Ephraim the Syrian, Basil the Great, Hilary of Poitiers, um, Eusebius of Caesarea, the 3rd century authors Hippolytus and Julius Africanus and the second century author Theophilus of Antioch. These are people who addressed the question and answered it that in fact it's an accurate record of history. Now if you go back and read those uh, that's an impressive list and it's rather number one extensive and number two includes some people that most people have never heard of before. Theodore of Mopsuestia, um, Hilary of Poitiers. Of interest is when you go and look at those references, they all reference the original articles. Or um, most of them are English translation, except for Hilary of Poitiers, Book of Mysteries 1 3 to 1 3 2. See the French translation in Jean Paul Bresson and I won't attempt the French. <clears throat> um, and so he's pointing you back to the original literature. There is in this set of references no reference to some secondary source that he's following. 
which means that if you take it uh, literally, which maybe we shouldn't, um, he's actually read all this stuff. All these authors agreed that the narratives of the Pentateuch had a double meaning. The literal meaning, which was an accurate record of historical events, and a deeper spiritual meaning. To find the deeper spiritual meaning, most of these authors advocated treating the Pentateuch's narratives as allegory, an extended metaphor in which characters, places, and events are symbols of spiritual principles. However, these authors are ex accepted the narratives as literal history even while interpreting them allegorically to gain spiritual insight. So you have this fairly large group that, according to the author here anyway, um, and I suppose I have no particular reason to doubt him at this point other than I wonder if he's read all of that stuff, C certainly carefully, uh, the literal meaning and the deeper spiritual meaning are both true, according to them. Not all ancient Christian authors agreed with that interpretation. According to another ancient Christian school of thought, the Pentateuch's narratives were, were uh, allegory only and were not historical accounts. And he has a large number of, of people writing again. In this theological camp were the fourth century authors Ambrose of Milan, Tychonius, Gregory of Nyssa, Didymus the Blind, uh, the third century authors Cyprian of Carthage, Origen, Tertullian, the second century authors Clement of Alexandria, Pantanus, uh, Justin Martyr, Papias of Hierapolis, Ignatius of Antioch, and the first century author of the Epistle of Barnabas. which is pseudonym, uh, pseudon, uh, pseudonym. It's not really an epistle of Barnabas. It claimed to be, but most people uh, agree that it wasn't. Um, again, you can read all those and they all refer to the original articles and you can get an English translation from them. But Didymus the Blind, you're referred to again, a French translation which I found interesting. So apparently this guy reads French pretty well. Uh, Tychonius, Gregory of Nyssa, and Origen pointed out numerous incongruities in the Pentateuchal, uh, Pentateuch narratives that indicate that the narratives cannot have been accurate history. As Origen puts it, who is so foolish as to suppose that God, after the manner of a husbandman, planted a paradise in Eden towards the east and placed it in a tree of life, visible and palpable, so that one tasting of the fruit by the bodily teeth obtained life. I do not suppose, those are by the way, his ellipses, mine will be green, and they're usually a little wider as well. I do not suppose that anyone doubts that these things figuratively indicate certain mysteries. Regarding other passages in Genesis, he wrote, in these stories, secret hi uh, history is not being narrative, but mysteries are interwoven. And there's my ellipses which just goes on origin saying more of the same kind of thing. According to Gregory of Nyssa, in the Pentateuch narratives, Moses is placing doctrines before us in the form of a story. And in Genesis, doctrine is set before us by Moses under this disguise of an historical manner. Tertullian added that much of the Pentateuch contains prophecies of Christ and has characteristics of prophetic announcements, that future events are announced as if they are already past, and that many events are figuratively predicted by means of enigmas and allegories and parables, and that they must be understood in a sense different from the literal description. According to Tertullian, when the Apostle Paul says the law, or the Pentateuch, is sp spiritual, although I would raise the question of whether uh, he meant the law as the Pentateuch or whether he meant the law as uh, uh, what Moses told us to do. Um, what he meant is that the true meaning of the Pentateuch is not its literal meaning but its figurative allegorical meaning. It were tedious, wrote Clement, to go over all the law specifying what is spoken of in enigmas for almost the whole scriptures give its, gives its utterance in this way. Apparently Clement felt that 
almost all the law, uh, almost all the whole scripture, which um, is, is spiritual and not to be understood in a literal way. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch even used the word muthois, or myths, fables, myths, for the Pentateuch stories, admonishing readers not to follow Jewish practices that came from myths told to the ancients. I'm not sure that proves what he wants it to prove, but um, I guess um, you know he's quoting something and, and giving you a context, and he expects you to trust that. The author of the Epistle of Barnabas, and this one he's probably right on, by the way, called the story of the Israelites' entry into the Promised Land a parable and pointed out that the command to rule over the fishes and birds and beasts is impossible to follow and therefore must not be taken literally. He quoted Isaiah 10 through 14 and Jeremiah 7, 22 through 23, reminding readers that in those two passages, God himself says he did not give commands about burnt sacrifices and he doesn't like blood sacrifices and observance of new moons or feast days, etc. Whereas, according to the Pentateuch narrative, God did indeed give the command for such observances. The only way to reconcile this apparent contradiction is to accept a figurative interpretation of the Pentateuch instead of a literal interpretation. Well, at least that's the only way that he can see. Some ancient authors expressed the opinion that scriptures contain multiple non-literal meanings in addition to the literal meaning, which of course wouldn't damage the literal meaning in that case. Ancient authors generally agreed that scripture has multiple valid senses. The point on which they disagreed was as to whether the literal sense was among the valid senses. In other words, whether the narratives were correct records of events or whether they were not. The Peritomes heresy. The question of whether or not to take the Pentateuch literally, that is, whether its literal sense is valid, was central to a controversy in the early church that involved the earliest Christian group to be labeled heretics. Paul's epistle to Titus in the New Testament contains the earliest recorded Christian use of the term hereticon, or heretical, Titus 3.10. Uh, there, Paul applies the term to mataiologoi, or empty talkers. Matthias is empty. Logoi is people who speak. Um, and uh, phrenapatai. Uh, phrenos, uh, you've heard of phrenology. It's the, uh, the idea of the brain and the mind um, and mind deluders who were spreading misinterpretations of the law. He's right on that score. Here I treat, this is the note <coughs> that is of interest here. Here I treat Titus and other pastoral epistles as Pauline, although some scholars doubt his authorship. See review in I. Howard Marshall, a critical and exegetical commentary on the pastoral epistles. However, the question of authorship is beside the point of this paper. The important thing here is that they are part of the Christian canon and therefore carry the weight of biblical authority. It sounds like he is saying, I treat them as Pauline. Some people don't believe that, and you almost get the feeling that I'm not sure whether I believe it either, but it doesn't matter because they're in the Bible, and you're stuck with them. Their misinterpretations prompted Paul to write four epistles, Galatians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, and Titus, specifically to combat their influence. I read that, and I thought, that's interesting. Given that, uh, that my master's thesis was on a passage in Colossians, and I had to go over a lot of people that were writing on Colossians and read Colossians through, translated from the Greek and so forth. Um, there is a huge debate, which he elides completely over, 
as to whether Colossians was written against the circumcision. And the vast majority of scholars believe that it was not. And as I read it, the people who argue that it's all Judaizers are number one in the minority, but number two don't seem to me to be persuasive. So at this point, I'm kind of going, eh, boy, they better write a bunch of, he better have some more things to say um, rather than just, uh, I would assume that he knows what he's talking about. Notice that there are no references for that. The misinterpretation that caused Paul the greatest consternation was their insistence that Gentile converts must be circumcised, and he explained that literal circumcision was unnecessary in several of his New Testament epistles, which he certainly did. The Paratomias appeared to have first made their views public as part of an attempt to correct what they thought were inaccuracies in the Christian message as it had been presented to the Gentiles. In its earliest stages, Christianity was a movement within the Jewish religion, and Christians at first preached the message only to other Jews. Even after persecution caused some geographical scattering of the movement to regions outside Judea, Paul and Barnabas began preaching to Gentiles in Antioch, and then spread the message to Jews and Gentiles in Cyprus and Asia Minor. And those ones are pretty straightforward. Uh, the Peritomes began their missionary activity after Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch. The group sent representatives there where they claimed that all believers must be circumcised according to the law of Moses in order to be saved. And that, again, that's something that has a good scriptural reference for. The Apostle Peter was visiting Antioch at the time and both he and Barnabas were intimidated enough by the Peritomes to separate themselves from the Gentiles when eating according to Jewish custom despite the fact that Peter had been living like a Gentile until then. And that is the straightforward interpretation of Galatians. Paul challenged this hypocrisy upon he, which he and Barnabas both disputed the circumcision requirement for Gentiles. The brethren in Antioch then sent a delegation to bring the question of Gentile circumcision to the Christian movement's authorities in Jerusalem. This event is now known as the Council of Jerusalem. The decision of the council was that the Gentiles were not bound to literally follow regulations from the Pentateuch, including circumcision, because salvation is by faith and not by observation of Jewish customs. The council made its decisions known via a letter that was sent abroad. This is, of course, the Acts 15 story. Um, there is a slight inaccuracy here, but it's an important one. The decision of the council was not that the Gentiles were not bound to literally follow regulations from the Pentateuch, including circumcision. It was narrowly tailored over circumcision, and in fact, the Jewish dietary laws were recommended, or at least some of them. You're to abstain from things strangled and from blood in particular, as well as fornication and meat offered to idols. The Peritomes did not accept the council's decision, and that's probably true, but opted to remain in the church and spread their message despite the approval of church authorities, prompting Paul to call them uh, an upotactoi. Unsubmissive is probably a better translation than rebellious, although we use the term rebellious very similarly that way. And apetes. Uh, disobedient, although if you're translating it literally, it would be unpersuaded. Uh, patho is to persuade. But it, it's used as, uh, as we would use the English word disobedient. So, uh, Paul wrote warnings about the Peritomes to churches in Colossae of Asia Minor and Philippi of Macedonia, and he wrote against the circumcision requirement to churches in Rome and Corinth. That part's definitely true. Circumcision but was but one of the Pentateuch regulations upon which uh, the Peritomes insisted. Paul recorded that they also demanded observations of regulations on diet, uh, which were acceded to, uh, some of them were acceded to in the Council of Jerusalem. Purity, cleanliness, and impurity, uncleanliness, and the observance of special days and seasons and years, including religious festivals and Sabbaths. Um, 
again, he's there. He's using Colossians in a way that I would be somewhat uncomfortable with. A range of practices that are derived from passages spanning all five volumes of the Pentateuch. He also records that they wanted to become teachers of the law. And that, again, is a scriptural reference, which is true. According to Paul, the Peritomes pr promoted muthois, myths, fables, and uh, genealogias, narratives with uh, biographical details, terms which the English language bio Bibles often renders as myths and genealogies, for what are obvious reasons. However, now this is interesting because he transcribes the letters of Peritomes, you'll notice. Um, that is, of course, a Greek term. Um, and uh, you know that he's doing that deliberately because he puts the line over the E in Peritomes. And yet, now he's quoting actual Greek words, which if you don't know Greek well, uh, you might miss. Uh, and it's an interesting mixture of styles. Uh, Peritomes is the only one that I think he transcribes that way. Although you will notice the term, a uh, Greek term, uh, genealogias, uh, that is geneal uh, genealogias, is uh, here, is transcribed uh, as well as having been written uh, in the Greek. Unlike the word genealogy, the Greek term refers to biographical details in general and not just ancestry. Although there's a heavy emphasis on uh, ancestry. People thought ancestry was more important in the ancient world than some do today. The myths and genealogies passages apparently refers to Jewish imitations of an unfortunate habit of some students. Um, I'm glad he says apparently because um, uh, for some it is not as apparent, shall we say. Uh, refer to Jewish imitations of an unfortunate habit of some students and teachers in contemporary Neos Greek schools of literature and philosophy who engage in trivia battles on minutia from Greek mythological literature and ridiculed those who had not memorized minute biographical details. Um, I wish he had a reference on that, but um, here he does recognize some divergence from his opinion. Modern commentators, uh, and he gives some examples. Interestingly, the Women's Bible Commentary is one of them. The Oxford Bible Commentary is another. If you're writing this to uh, people who are conservatives, I'm not sure either one of those commentaries is that impressive, but uh, maybe he's not thinking about his audience when he chose the, one, the references he's got, often repeat the mistake of Tertullian and the late second century Bishop Irenaeus, who thought that these myths and genealogies were the Gnostic her heresy of Valentinus. Um, I can tell you from my reading that, uh, yes, that opinion is quite common. I'm not sure that it's uh, as much of a mistake as he makes it out to be, because most people would say the proto-Gnostics, they're earlier than Valentinius. Uh, see the English translation in Robertson, Donaldson, and Nicene Fathers, and, and Irenaeus of Lyon. Um, however, Valentinus was not born until long after Paul's death, and that's true. Uh, and Paul specified that the myths were Eudaikos Muthois, Jewish myths, that were promoted by the Peritomes. Um, Titus 1, 10 through 14. Now that's interesting because he has the reference there. Um, he's um, uh, as I look at that, I'm going. He's asking us to ignore most commentaries without making really a major argument against it other than that Valentinus wasn't born. Uh, but there are a lot of people that think that the ideas of Valentinus didn't spring 
from his own head immediately, but that there were a lot of other people that were saying the same things before him. Um, now, to go back to the, let's see if I can get it, the original, you'll notice that um, here I get a hint as to what he might be using to support himself for some of the things he has to say. And that is reference 76, that genealogies refers to biographical details in general and not just ancestry. Um, that you, you might think of it as an annotated um, genealogy. And he cites myths and genealogies in note on the polemic of the pastoral epistles in the Journal of Theological Studies. And for the next uh, several references, he's going to quote this work. Um, four or five times uh, and always a favorable quote using it as an authority. So maybe that's where he got a good share of what he had to say. Most scholars abhorred the practice which they considered offensive and rude. And we go back to the main part of the literature. But it nevertheless persisted among small-minded individuals. And there's that Colson reference again. The hypothesis that the Peritomes engaged in such trivia debates explains much of the context of Paul's epistles to Timothy and Titus. His denunciation of moros, uh, moros or foolish, uh, from which we get our English term moron, uh, zetesis, arguments or questionings, originally seekings, but arguments came out of that pretty easily, over genealogias, that's uh, and again, notice the mixture of peritomes, genealogius, um, and moros, which is, and zetesis, which is uh, flat out Greek. Uh, narratives with biological details and nomikos regarding the law, and we're switched back to Greek again, are consistent with Pentateuch trivia debates as a form of ant antagonistic showboating. Uh, well, yeah, maybe. Paul uh, called such practices bebelus, profane or heathen, uh, 78, which we're going to come back to in a bit, uh, suggesting, which suggests that they were derived from the example of pagan Greeks. Um, pagan minutiae collectors charged fees for trivial lessons, which is consistent with Paul's condemnation of the peritomes for teaching Torah trivia for monetary profit. Celibacy was required of students in Greek schools, which is consistent with the forbidding of marriage by the Peritomes. Reference 82, which does not refer to Colson, it refers to an actual text, and we'll look at the, that text as well. All of these Pauline passages support the hypothesis that the Peritomes taught the Torah in the manner of Greek schools. What are those texts? Um, this is the vain and profane babblings. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. And that, by the way, is the end of, I think it's 1 Timothy. Um, and we've looked at science falsely so-called before. Um, and um, science is not something that the Greeks would, uh, pardon me, that the uh, Jewish heretics would have used because their emphasis was on the law, not on knowledge, epignosis, which is the actual Greek word there. Um, right, maybe gnosis, I'll have to refresh my memory on that. Um, and then another, the, 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 the 81 ref references forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Um, and you will search in that area, uh, in both of those texts, and find it difficult to pin this one on Jews. And in fact, the gnosis is pretty typical of 
Greek thought rather than Jewish thought. Modern commentators emphasize the legalistic ten tendencies of the paratomes, but those tendencies were merely outgrowths of a more basic underlying attitude, a literalistic approach to the Pentateuch. In this, they resembled the Pharisees, whose support for them is therefore understandable because the Pharisees accepted only the literal wording of the Pentateuch and did not accept that a hidden, hidden meaning was present, present behind the literal wording as they reveal in their ancient writings. Of course, uh, could there be something beyond that? Actually, the Pharisees are, that's probably not fair even to the Pharisees, but the Pentateuch is an allegory in Jewish thought in the New Testament. Other Jewish schools of thought from the first century AD, um, other than the Peritonmes, obviously, uh, insisted that the true meaning of the Pentateuch was not to be found in its literal mean wording. Rather, the literal wording cloaked a deeper hidden spiritual meaning, which was the true meaning of the Pentateuch. Its narratives should be, therefore be considered allegory, not history. The Therapeutae, a Jewish monastic sect in Egypt, accepted the Torah as allegory. The monastic Jewish sect at Qumran in Palestine also pre interpreted the Torah as allegory, a set of messianic prophecies that were veiled in the form of a story. Well, so did Christians for that matter, in, at least in some sense. Um, but the story was usually thought to be accurate. The Darshi Rishimot and the Darshi Hamirot, uh, two Palestinian Jewish schools of thought viewed the Torah's stories as symbols of spiritual principles, not historical records. The Dorsi Hamirot explicitly rejected the necessity to follow the Torah's regulations as they were literally worded. Ah. So the Torah has to be included, all of it, including the regulations, as being valid now or else you're not taking the Torah literally. Stating that it was necessary only to follow the underlying spiritual sense of each rule. Um, the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria agreed that the narratives were not literal history but advocated that the regulations be followed as spiritual exercises to keep the practitioner in constant remembrance of the spiritual principles that the regulations symbolized. Now, there's two questions. One, did Moses receive those uh, writings and write them down? And are they applicable today? And the answer to both of those, one of them may be yes and the other may be no. Um, Jesus himself revealed his stance, his stance on the literality of the Pentateuch in apparent conflict between his words and his actions. On the one hand, he said, do not think that I came to destroy the law. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, he himself repeatedly broke the Torah's commands in their literal sense and taught others to do likewise. He did this with the Pentateuch's eye for an eye laws, although it seems like he made it stricter, Sabbath regulations, dietary regulations, the, the quote there is Mark's uh, a passage where he said, where Mark says he therefore declared all foods clean. Um, divorce regulations, where again he made it stricter, and the requirement of capital punishment for adultery, where he did uh, loosen that somewhat. The only way to reconcile violation of these rules with insistence that they must be followed is except that Jesus meant that one should observe this underlying spiritual sense of the Torah and not its literal sense. It is therefore evident that Jesus taught the true meaning of the Pentateuch was not its literal sense but its hidden spiritual meaning. This explains why Peter lived like a Gentile while he called the Genesis flood a symbol by explaining the cleansing of the heart is the antitype, antitupon, um, that which is symbolized of the flood and why the Council of Jerusalem waived the literal observance of the Pentateuch regulations, well, some of them, specifically uh, circumcision for Gentile Christians, and why Paul, a former Pharisee, considered his previous Pharisaic studies in Jewish observances a waste of effort. 
It also explains Paul's statement that those who don't literally follow, follow the regulations of the law nevertheless uphold the law if they live by faith. A plethora of passages in his New Testament epistles indicate that Paul had discarded the idea that the Pentateuch was a historical record. Hmm, could have fooled me. Um, for example, all five volumes of the Pentateuch describe the ritual and legal regulations as having been delivered by God, but according to Paul, those regulations came not from God, but from man. Um, we'll look at that reference. This insistence by Paul is irreconcilable with ex acceptance of the Pentateuch as history, and therefore constitutes strong evidence that Paul did not accept the Pentateuch narrative as a literal account of actual events. Um, there's three texts in that reference. Number one, Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Almost all commentators, I think uh, you can point to one or two that will argue that philosophy refers to, philosophia in Greek, refers to um, uh, as some kind of Greek or Greek, at, at best Jew, Greek Jewish mixture and not flat out Judaism. Um, uh, Colossians 2.20, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. And I guess that he's saying that this applies to the Jewish law. Again, uh, that's not the majority of commentators. Which things have a, indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. It's a difficult passage to translate, but, uh, but the, uh, the commandments and doctrines of men is usually assumed to be either Greek or Jewish-Greek syncretism and not referring to the Torah itself. And finally, there's Titus, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Now, if you try really hard, you can say the Jewish fables refers to the Pentateuch itself and not what some people said about the Pentateuch. Um, I guess that's how he's uh, uh, explicating the Titus passage. Continuing with the article, Paul identifies Adam's union with Eve as a symbol of Christ in the church, identifies, uh, which is pretty standard, uh, identifies God's promise to Abraham about his seed as a symbolic reference to spiritual offspring, uh, but nothing there says that it didn't really happen, it just says that it's a symbol of it, or a type, or whatever you call it. And the type implies, implies that the type actually exists identifies the instruction to circumcise as a symbol for a spiritual state, identifies ritual regulations as symbolic references to the mystery of Christ, and explicitly identifies the story of Ishmael and Isaac as allegory. Um, again, I, I have a hard time finding where he says, and it didn't actually happen, it is only allegory. He identifies the Israelites' passage through the Red Sea and the accompanying cloud as symbols for baptism, man as a symbol for spiritual food, and the rock from which water flowed is a symbol of Christ. He further reveals his stance that the Pentateuch stories are metaphors by claiming that the promised land of the promised land still holds, which would be absurd if the Pentateuch is a historical account because the promise would have been fulfilled centuries earlier. This statement by Paul is inconsistent with the acceptance of the literal sense of the Pentateuch narrative. In the same passage, he equates the promised land with God's seventh-day Sabbath rest in Genesis and states that this rest is a state of spiritual rest into which a believer can enter rather than literal rest on a literal day in the literal past. Um, that is a reference to Hebrews. Uh, 
And it is fascinating to me that he completely elides over the controversy as to the, um, uh, as to who wrote Hebrews in the first place. And uh, that's one that's been debated and several people have been picked in besides Paul. And uh, in fact, you'll find a hard time finding in the ancient literature people who say it was Paul and Hebrews never actually says it's Paul. In his New Testament epistle to the Romans, Paul seems to blame the existence of sin and death on a historical Adam. But this is, is an illusion caused by English language wording in which Paul's Hebrew and Greek speaking double entendres don't translate well. Paul uses wordplay frequently in his New Testament epistles and he frequently employs puns on the name Adam which is Hebrew for a man or humankind, and the word anthropos, uh, which is uh, Greek for a man, humankind, actually anthropos, if you're going to go with the Greek pronunciation of the time, uh, humankind or human nature. Paul calls an, oh, a person's early, earthly sinful nature from before salvation the old anthropos, Again, notice that anthropos is now here transliterated into English. Um, or the first man, Adam, and treats the dirt which Ad of which Adam was made in Genesis account as a symbol of this nature. He calls a person's heavenly righteous nature after salvation the new anthropos, or the last second Adam, and treats the breath of life that God breathed into the earth Adam to bring him to life in the Genesis account as a symbol of this nature. His statement that the sin and death came from one man, one of two human natures, is a continuation of this pun, and his point is that sin and death are products of the earthly human nature. The Peritomes had a very strong grasp of the literal sense of the law. Paul's statement that they did not understand the very law they wanted to teach is therefore best explained, at least in his opinion, as a reference to their misunderstanding of it as literal history, whereas it should be understood as allegory. In their literalist hand, the Pentateuch's narratives, which should be allegorically interpreted as spiritual instructions, were reduced to simple muthois, fables or myths, eudiakois muthois, Jewish myths, and graudes muthois, wives' tales are literally old ladies' fables. Um, Phrases that speak for themselves regarding Paul's opinion as to the historic historicity of the Pentateuch's narratives. Um, that may be overdoing it. In using these terms, Paul was not disparaging the narratives, but was simply acknowledging their non-historicity. Paul had great respect for the proper use of the Pentateuch's narratives. He called them God-breathed and listed ways in which they are useful. <coughs> That list of ways does not include, include utility as historical records, but does include utility as sources of doctrine, correction of wayward behavior, and instruction in righteousness. Interesting. Implications for Christian acceptance of scientific findings. Numerous findings of science contradict the literal wording of the count in the Pentateuch. Such findings indicate that the various kinds of organisms were not created separately but evolved from a common ancestor. And uh, these are references that uh, you can, uh, are pretty standard evolutionary uh, references, that the Earth and the universe are billions, not just a few thousand years old, that a worldwide flood never happened. Archaeological data show that numerous details in the stories of the patriarchs in Israel's journey to the Promised Land are historically inaccurate. Uh, that's a reference to Finkelstein and Silberman. Uh, we're going to go over some of that uh, in the fairly near future, I think. Um, uh, but it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting acceptance of, of that scholarship without challenge. If the Pentateuch is taken literally, these findings of science must be rejected. However, as shown here, numerous passages in the New Testament ex oppose acceptance of the Pentateuch as literal history and instead advocate acceptance of the Pentateuch in a figurative sense. Uh, I'm not sure that that should be E.G. instead of I.E. as allegory, but whatever. Therefore, 
for those who accept the biblical wording as authoritative, the New Testament removes an important obstacle to the acceptance of scientific findings, such as evidence for biological evolution and an old earth. My take, just wow. Jesus said in John 7.22, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and you on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. He seems to be accepting the historicity of that account. It's hard for me to put some kind of division between Jesus and Paul in that regard. I don't think that Paul would have said, Moses didn't actually say that. Moses didn't actually, according to Center, Moses didn't actually give circumcision to the Jews. That was meant spiritually, and the Jews mistakenly took it literally. In fact, according to his note too, Moses didn't actually give it, and Jesus was wrong as well. I think I'm following the argument. The circumcision party believed that because the law said all males should be circumcised on the eighth day, that during the New Testament times, which was now for then, um, everyone who believed in Jesus should be circumcised. The answer of the apostolic church, according to the argument, was to deny that the law was ever meant to be followed literally, not just what Moses said we should do, but the entire historical uh, record. That meant that all of the Pentateuch was figurative, including the history. I am not sure I can buy that argument. The guy is either brilliant, reading Greek and French fluently, and having extensive knowledge of the early church fathers and Thomas Aquinas, or he is following someone and covering his tracks very well. Um, referring to them and never saying so-and-so, uh, actually if you follow so-and-so you'll get uh, the points I'm trying to make. He is, in my opinion, eccentric, expecting us to believe, accept minority biblical positions without an argument, apparently on his say-so. No defense. I will not hold his geological training against him, nor will I say a priori that he has no right to a biblical interpretation without theological training. That's fair game for anybody. Although maybe theological training might have helped him uh, avoid some easy pitfalls. But the position he takes is not convincing to me, nor do I fully trust him to be objective. He seems to exhibit sloppy exegesis. His exegesis that is sloppy seems to be rather convenient for him. And I'm not sure he believes his own exegesis. That is to say, he claims that the Bible is authoritative, but he doesn't believe that Moses wrote the vast bulk of the Pentateuch. And his argument seems to be, well, you believe the Bible, and the Bible gives indication that the Pentateuch was never meant to be taken literally, whereas he never states that for him the Bible is authoritative in some particular way. And in fact, if anything, the reverse seems to be the case. Maybe I'm being too harsh, but in that case, it would be nice to see more evidence of his personal belief. The title of his last book, and a sympathetic review of it, seems to indicate that he finds it too easy, too easy for the reviewer to resort to sarcasm. The argument here seems to me to be just a little too cute. And finally, I will point out something interesting. He seems to be endorsing one religious view over another in this paper, which I guess is out of bounds for teaching. At least that's the implication of what he has to say. And, uh, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. So comment over here. And I would have to commend the gentleman for his research and, and scripture. He certainly has uh, quite a 
uh, quite a background in, in studying all these different uh, areas. Uh, I would want to question him on well, what do you think about Jesus Christ? You know, where, where do you stand with him? Yeah. And, and, and since he takes some of an ornery uh, and derogatory uh, thing towards people that take the Bible literally, I, I tend to get a little ornery too sometimes, and I, want, I would want to ask him if he'd ever been circumcised and why. Uh, well, it's, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, frankly, Having done a little work of that kind, I don't think he's read the whole thing. And I certainly don't think he's read it carefully, uh, trying to understand it. Uh, because I don't see how you can come to those positions uh, if you are, uh, I mean, reading every single one of those authors would take you years. Guy's a geologist by profession. I just don't see him spending every spare minute of his time, uh, you know, reading St. Thomas Aquinas and finding these little nuggets. I think he's following somebody, and he just isn't telling us who. But. This is the author of the paper that we talked about before. That's correct. Yeah, that was my memory. I've been fascinated since I first read the article, now listening to your review, how he takes the mere fact that there's a recorded discussion of a particular interpretation or topic to give him the freedom to instruct us on which is right. And that it seems to me his whole thesis breaks down to just that. If there's a discussion we're open to choose what part of the discussion is right and ignore the rest. And <laughs> yet he treats science as holy, unassailable. Never really talks about scientific discussion of some of the points he's dealing with. So this is a polemic, not, not a thoughtful review in my mind. Well, it's it's intended, uh, maybe it is intended simply to be a polemic and that's, uh, he doesn't really expect us to take it that seriously. Although in that case, I think he doesn't expect us to take the subject that seriously. Um, I think it was intended to be written so that it could be mistaken for um, an honest search for truth. But I'm not convinced that it is. I would agree, but I think we have to re remain cognizant of the fact that his target audience is high school science teachers. True. And you're basically telling them, oh, well, I, I know you don't have the background I have, so let me tell you that all of this interpretation of scripture is garbage if you let it influence the way you interpret science. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I was remembering um, Jesus' words to the Jews. If you had believed Moses, you would have believed me because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? So if the Pentateuch was written as pure allegory, could By Jesus, people thousands could of Jesus years really have held the Jews accountable to an allegory for missing the historical Jesus? Maybe Jesus was an allegory too, I <laughs> Well, in that case, we should just dismiss. <laughs> just the uh, comment may not be here or there, but I see creeping into the church, um, the Adventist church, that if Paul were alive today, he wouldn't have written what he wrote. And, Don't worry, uh, it's in other Christian churches too. <laughs> oh yeah, it, but you know I'm an Adventist, so it kind of hits me. So where you, I am. you can you you know about that part? Yeah. So <laughs> um, it seems to be you can be uh, judgmental over Scripture in light of current events, 
and that really didn't mean that. And Paul was mistaken. And if he came back to life today, wow, we would have a different set of uh, Pauline writings. If and, Jesus uh, had only lived past the age of 30, what would his mature theology have been? <laughs> yeah. No, I like that. Then I read another one where someone said, uh, uh, speaking of LGBTQ and all that, he said, we need to take all the clobber verses out of the Bible. Now, I know he probably didn't mean literally, but we're starting to say things that cast shade on Scripture. And, uh, you know, you can say things in a way that doesn't cast shade or disrespect on Scripture, but what he's doing for science here, there are some doing for Adventists, too, in my humble opinion. Yeah. I think this gentleman is uh, trying to sell his books to the high school, two million high school, and uh, make the government pay for it. Because he, in his 2019 book, he refers to himself in 2016 book and his 2017 books. How smart. Yes. And by the way, it's a book that's not online. Yeah, there you go. Um, so if you really want to know what it is, you have to buy it. And it's not in too many libraries, so apparently he didn't feel it worth well selling to to that but um, uh, if one were cynical one could call what he was doing as equivalent to those Greek people who were trying to make money off of their teaching but uh, I'd prefer not to go too far into that but I, I this would behoove us uh, at least that would help me. Uh, he refers to, like, I think he talked about collagen studies and microcrystallization, bacterial. Um, I think it would be great for us to, to help us as well. I think you have done some studies on this. Uh, yes. Uh. When I read the article, and, and even now more strongly, I think to me the most, what should I say, perhaps the most in, important piece to think about is that this was the lead article in a professional science journal from the American biology teachers, which really puts them in the area of dictating how these rather naive teachers who can't think for themselves should approach a student who's uh, thinking seriously about uh, things like radioactive carbon in old fossils. The whole purpose is to say ignore that, just take, just take what we tell you in science is accurate and leave the rest. Yeah. Tell your students to do the same. Yeah. The thing, the, the, the biggest thing that I see is, here's a guy who has made this long argument and then references it in his article so that you can't miss it about how one theological position is better than another one. And then he says, well, you know, as long as you don't uh, take a religious stand, you're okay. And he just got through taking a religious stand. It's almost as if conservative Christians don't have any rights in this area. That you can take a religious stand against them if you want to, that's okay. But just don't don't speak at, you know, versus, I guess, liberal Christian versus uh, Jews versus Muslim versus Hindus. None of that should be t touched. But, you know, if you want to say that conservative Christians who believe the Bible was recorded in the first instance as primarily history with perhaps overtones in 
I think you can argue from the Bible that certainly overtones, but that it was primarily written as history. Uh, that position is just not acceptable, and therefore, uh, and therefore can be ignored, stomped on, um, uh, denigrated. Uh, you know, if you're using that as your reason not not to believe evolution, you don't have any right to do that. And that's almost the feeling I get from it. I, I think one of the things, though, we can read that and we can react to it. We can say, you know, that doesn't really work. And furthermore, it's not fair. And furthermore, it's not faithful to the original. But I think it's important to understand that there are people who think that way and to really understand what they're saying because that's what you're going to run into if you start dealing with people who um, don't both come from and somewhat accept a conservative Christian background. This is what you'll see and you might as well know it exists. Yes. There's just one other small comment from on my part, and that is, uh, he focuses this whole thing on young Earth creationists. He doesn't touch old Earth creationists because the arguments he make tend to fall apart almost immediately with respect to geological history, and the so he he avoids that area completely. Yes. Which is a huge flaw. Brian, do you have any comments? Well, first I'd like to uh, give my appreciation to uh, Wild and, and, and very comprehensive romp through a very complicated argument, which I think you did extremely well in a fairly in a very brief period of time I um, I too would um, have uh, some I don't think you need to say it's it's all one or the other and uh, but everyone who uh, who is a scientist in the modern world and reasonably well informed and is also a Christian has to deal with the problem is Genesis to be interpreted literally or figuratively. Because if you interpret it literally, you very quickly run into the scientific conundrum. And if you interpret it as allegory, the question is, so it looks like it was intended to be t interpreted. It looks like it was written to be read literally. And so when, if you're going to read Genesis as allegory, which is the direction I think he, he went in. When do you, from the text itself, determine that it's now time to switch back into the literal mode? But I was, I was unaware of the, um, of the breadth of the literature about the early church fathers, because they weren't dealing with um, evolution. They were dealing with the text itself and the problems that it appeared to be um, confronting them with. And um, uh, thank you. It was um, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun going back to listen and listening to the early church fathers and all that they had to say about the problem that we face today in an entirely different fashion. Because clearly, evolution as a an alternative um, was not available. Age of the Earth was not available. The, these have been problems only for the last 400 years. So they were clearly encountering the same problem we encounter today, but for somewhat different reasons. Anyway, thank you. It was a nice romp through an enormous um, literature that um, I was only distantly, I'd only actually read two of those ancient authors. <laughs>
You know, it's interesting because I went through in depth on uh, Augustine at one point, and Augustine is very literal about most of of Genesis. He has a great deal of trouble with the six days because, uh, well, actually, he gives three reasons, and one of them is that how do you have light going around the world for he, he believed in a round world, by the way, as did most of his contemporaries. How, how do you get light going around the world uh, before the sun? And of course, nowadays, all you have to have is unidirectional light, and the earth turns and that takes care of it. Um, but Augustine didn't have that as a, an option in his uh, toolkit, shall we say. Um, the second one was there was an interpretation of a passage uh, in Ecclesiasticus, which is not Ecclesiastes, it's a uh, part of the uh, uh, Apocrypha. And it said, he made all things, in uh, Augustine's translation it said simul, which sounds like simultaneous. And in fact, that's what the Latin meant. Uh, uh, and when Augustine made his argument, he actually quoted the text. And uh, that seems to be not allowing for six-day creation. Um, it turns out that the original Greek of that was koine, which means altogether, sort of, uh, he made everything, uh, reemphasizing the uh, uh, the totality of what he made rather than the time frame. Um, and so that was a bad translation of an apocryphal text that he had to deal with. And the third thing that he had to deal with, and he's, he's very explicit about all this stuff. I mean, you can read it. Uh, uh, the literal meaning of Genesis has now been translated. Uh, the Latin's been available for a long time, but, but you can get the English now. Um, and the third thing he said was that uh, if God made everything perfect, it had to be made at once. That this idea of doing things in stages was just not, um, not the way a perfect God would do things. And um, uh, it was heavily influenced by Platonic philosophy. Uh, and, uh, of course, now nobody believes that anymore. The people who believe uh, that the passage is accurate will give it six days. The people who don't believe it's accurate will give it um, four billion years. So uh, the idea that it happened all at once is kind of a lost cause at this point. I think Platonic philosophy has lost that much influence. Um, and uh, that's interesting. When he summarizes Augustine, he puts it in the um, literal and symbolic, uh, which is where I would be, by the way. Um, Origin probably does belong, in, for sure, in the uh, symbolic. Um, some of those other people I'm not uh, quite as sure of. Clement of Alexandria may be uh, a student of, of, uh, of Origin, as I recall. Um, but some of the other people, I'd like to see a few more passages, and I'm not sure he's done enough reading to be able to characterize them completely. Uh, but, uh, but there is the interpretation that God didn't actually give the law. It just was not a popular interpretation. What most people said was, yes, God gave the law, but it wasn't the final answer. And in fact, I think I would put the Apostle Paul in that, in that grouping as well. Um, once you start doing that, I think the case that he's making starts to fall apart. 
because then you can believe that it was history, but just that not all of the things that were said were perfect. And of course, if you have a philosophy that doesn't require a perfect God, which means that God can never change because change implies imperfection, um, because you're going from a state to another state that's more perfect. Well, you weren't perfect in the first state then, right? I mean, that, that's the philosophical argument that, uh, that enables Aristotle to speak about the unmoved mover. Because, you see, if he moves, then he is not perfect. The world can be un imperfect, that's okay. But God cannot be because, uh, because to be imperfect is to not be something that God should be. I, it's an interesting philosophical argument. It doesn't seem to hold much water in, in places outside of Greek philosophy. Um, but the, the Hebrew God does seem to be able to interact, but at the same time be eternal and encompass all, of the, all time at one time, which means that his perfection is of a different kind than the perfection that was seen by, the, uh, by Plato as being absolutely perfect. Um, uh, it's an interesting argument. Uh, I suppose that we'll see more arguments of the same general kind uh, further on down. And it's interesting that when, when, if you read his notes carefully, he seems to be very, uh, very happy with the idea that, that Number one, the Old Testament really is all allegory, which means if you don't get the right allegory, uh, I mean, literally you're probably, you're, you're stuck with certain things. Allegorical, you can kind of, uh, uh, you can avoid any position you want, and that means the Bible can't really tell you anything either, which is an unfortunate um, circumstance. But uh, the Bible is, uh, the New Testament isn't much more authoritative for him from the sound of it. And I almost get the feeling that he's kind of playing with theology and having fun with us, and it doesn't really matter to him. He did quote Christ as an authority, so he... Uh, yeah, he quoted Christ. He did quote Christ as an authority. Um, but like I say, Christ seems to have accepted circumcision as real in terms of what Moses said. And he accepts Moses too. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. So, anyway, um, uh, I guess. Sure. Let me just pass this back up to you. It, I think it's still working. We'll see. I'm not going to word this right. Should we expect the Seventh-day Adventist and the Seventh-day Adventist Church to have to run into the kinds of questions uh, that are being raised in this paper? Because I think sometimes that's what I'm expecting, that we shouldn't have to argue some of these things within the church. Um, I'm going to say that I think we should. Uh, I'm not saying that, uh, that the, this should ever be the majority Adventist position, or it should be the majority any other denomination position for that matter. But the fact of the matter is that I think we will see it. And I think that, uh, uh, well, I suspect that we're not going to be able to look at any church organization in the end and say, well, what did they say? And I'll just take it for, for truth. Um, I, think that, I think that in the end, uh, church organizations are not going to be particularly helpful uh, because the the ones that are 
that will continue to exist probably won't be helpful, and the ones that are helpful probably won't continue to exist. Uh, <laughs> I think we've got a great future ahead of us. So, well, it, you know, keep in mind that, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble comes just before the second coming. So I need to just keep calm and carry on. Keep calm and carry on. Do you, you do due diligence. Um, learn what you can. Allow God to use you in what way He can. And uh, you know, don't worry too much about what you haven't learned yet. But when you have the opportunity, improve it. You know, you don't yell if you're given one talent. You don't yell that you weren't given five. But on the other hand. You do improve the talent you've got. Thank you. We just heard that in the sermon today. The yeah. talents. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Anyway, uh, we'll see you next week, um, and uh, we'll probably look at. Uh, as you can see, the Exodus is actually entwined with the uh, uh, with the uh, creation story. Uh, it isn't like there's a big divide between the two of them that, uh, that nothing crosses over. Uh, there are some issues that are similar.